So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Keith. I'm with Abode Energy Management. I'm here with my colleague, Mike Simons, uh, Nikhil Nagkarni as well with the City of Cambridge and Francesca Resnick with All In Energy. The webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will be posted online following the webinar uh, sometimes, sometime later this week or early next week. And it will also be distributed by email to everyone who's registered for the event. So thank you for being here. It's great that we have so many people. Uh, there is an entry poll, just getting some information on the demographics of folks who are here tonight. And we look forward to speaking with you all. So thanks for being here. Mike, if we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So tonight's agenda, we'll be talking about the program. Uh, we'll also be bringing in a few other programs that are active in the city of Cambridge that are related to this initiative. And we'll be talking about some of the, the main promoted technologies within this program. And at the end, we'll open it up for a question and answer session with Nikhil, as well as with our technical specialist here, Mike. Next slide. Great. So throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, uh, if you wouldn't mind just putting them in through the question and answer tool function, uh, and we'll answer some as we go through. Others we may save until the question and answer session at the end. If you are calling in on a phone rather than joining on computer, uh, if you press star nine, that will grant you the ability to raise your hand at the end. Uh, and we'll reiterate that when we get to the Q&A session. Next slide. All right, so I'll hand it over to Nikhil here to uh, introduce himself and some of the other programs. Sure, yeah, I just wanna take a minute to thank everyone for joining and, and welcome you uh, to the Cambridge Clean Heat Program. Um, my name is Nikhil Nidkarni. I'm an energy planner at the City of Cambridge in the Community Development Department. Um, we're at 344 Broadway City Hall Annex, um, a building that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, next slide, please. So uh, just to provide some introduction, Cambridge Energy Alliance is the city's initiative to help residents and small businesses connect to different energy efficiency and renewable energy opportunities. Um, you know, we've uh, done a number of different initiatives uh, for solar and, and for renewable energy and for home energy efficiency that um, you'll hear about in just a second. Uh, but, but really we have programs for homeowners, renters, condo owners and landlords. So, you know, something for everyone. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for the clean heating and cooling program specifically, um, you know, we started this a couple of years ago. Um, I would say about two or three years ago, we started getting more and more inquiries from Cambridge residents um, about heat pumps, uh, specifically about how to compare different options in the marketplace, um, how to find a reputable installer, um, and, you know, trying to just understand some of the, the incentives out there. Um, so seeing this need uh, from Cambridge residents, we really wanted to bring in um, a partner that could provide uh, the appropriate technical expertise um, and really provide some independent advice so that uh, Cambridge residents could have access to, you know, the best information possible to make an informed uh, decision about, about heat pumps and to connect with a qualified installer in the process. Um, so that's when we started piloting the Cambridge Clean Heat Program. Um, the other side to this is that heating and cooling is about 50%, um, actually a little bit more than 50% of the energy use in uh, Cambridge buildings. So as we think about our climate goals and our net zero goals, uh, supporting energy efficiency and clean energy in our buildings is gonna be a big part of how we get there. Um, so we started working with Abode about a year and a half, almost two years ago now to expand the pilot and to really uh, build it into a robust clean heating program. Um, and we're really excited to have their expertise on board, uh, you know, to provide that independent advice so that Cambridge residents have a resource uh, as they think through the, the options that are best for them. Um, so with that, I, was, uh, I wanted to turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Francesca, to talk about some of the other energy efficiency programs that we have that could be a good, uh, you know, supplement or complement to uh, clean heating. Thank you, Nikhil, and thank you everyone for joining us. 
Um, my name is Francesca. I work for the nonprofit All In Energy. We are an official partner of the city of Cambridge, and we work with the city to do all of the programs that you see on this slide. We do outreach and help connect residents. So the bulk of what we do is connecting residents to massive, no cost home energy assessments. This is a really phenomenal program. It's a utility sponsored program, but you actually pay for it every single month on your utility bill. So it's really a bill payer sponsored program. Um, and you can have someone come out to your house, perform the energy assessment. And then there are a plethora of benefits that you might receive ranging from things like thermostats all the way up to 75 to hundred percent off insulation in your entire home, depending on your particular situation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about HEAs in the next slide. We're also doing the Sunny Cambridge program right now, which is all of our solar and community solar options. Solar, of course, is the traditional solar PV rooftop model that we think of, and we can help you get connected to that. But there are also a lot of community solar opportunities, which is something that is relatively new. Maybe you haven't heard of it, but it's really great because it can help you save money and it can help you <clears throat> contribute to developing new solar projects in the state of Massachusetts. Sets. So you can go to the Sunny Cambridge um, part of our website and see more about that if that sounds like something that's interesting to you. Like Nikhil said, this is not like an either or thing. It's something that you can do in addition to and in combination. Um, so um, as some of you may know, in Cambridge, you can be automatically enrolled in the green electricity, the Community Choice Electricity Program. But then you can opt up to the 100% green option, which means that your energy comes from completely Massachusetts certified green sources. Um, and something that you can do is you can actually opt up to 100% green and do community solar. So you can be getting 100% green energy while saving money by doing community solar and contributing to something good in the clean energy sphere. So they can all be combined. Um, we also are launching a new multifamily energy program for five plus units where you can be connected with a multifamily advisor. And we also have a fantastic new program run through our nonprofit, which is the utility bill helpline. So you can call the number that you see below and you can go through your entire uh, utility bill and make sure that you are not accidentally signed up to um, harmful third party energy suppliers. That's something we see a lot in the city of Cambridge. If if you are eligible for the RT rate, but you aren't on it, we can make sure you're on it, all of those kinds of things. Um, so those are some of the programs available in Cambridge. Um, I think the next slide is about the home energy assessments. So while we are talking about um, electrifying and getting things to be completely um, carbon free, it is important to remember that efficiency, energy efficiency is the low hanging fruit. It's the easiest thing you can do. And one of the best ways to do that is to make sure that your home is buttoned up and you can get that done through the mass save home energy assessment by getting your home completely insulated and energy efficient. Um, and as we know, homes um, and heating homes, especially in New England, are responsible for a lot of carbon emissions in the States. So having an efficient home is really important and all in energy through the Mass Save program can also get you connected to the 0% interest seven year heat loan for some of these improvements. So if you're interested in learning more about our work, you can go to allinenergy.org, but all of the programs that we help Cambridge with can be found on the Cambridge Energy Alliance. Great. Thanks, Francesca. I think Francesca may be dropping, so we really appreciate you joining tonight. Uh, that was a great overview of all of the programs, and really I can't stress enough that combining these programs together is just a great way to treat your home holistically, comprehensively, and sort of attack it from all angles, so to speak. Um, and now I will hand it over to Mike, I believe, to talk about electrification and what that means in the context of the city and as a whole. Uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Mike Simons and I'll be uh, taking it from here. So when we're thinking about electrification, what we're just trying to be thinking about is kind of these one for one swaps as far as moving away from carbon based applications uh, that we're using in and around our home. 
Uh, so an easy one to be thinking about is moving from a gas stove to an induction cooktop. Um, one of the things in my background, uh, besides running a lot of energy audits with being a healthy home evaluator, is we, we, anytime that you're burning gas in home, there's a lot of byproducts of it with NOx, uh, CO. Um, so just removing that from the home, not only is it going to be reducing the carbon emissions, but it's also going to be making your home healthier. Uh, other things that are very easy to decarbonize when they, uh, you know, when they break is uh, a lawn equipment. So there's a lot of ancillary benefits with doing that one. Your neighbors aren't going to be as grumpy as you as you're running a device at 90 or 100 decibels. Instead, a lot of the electric lawn equipment are, you know, in the 50 to 70 range. Um, and what has been a very, very exciting thing that has uh, drastically reduced a handful of people's carbon footprint is uh, EVs. Um, so over here, I have a little bit of a joke for the, for the hippie crowd that may be on, uh, on this webinar today. Um, but EVs are completely market ready, whether it's from <laughs> the American manufacturers or European uh, or Asian um, Volts, Volts, Teslas, uh, they're all real. Uh, electric pickup trucks are going to be market ready as soon as next year. Um, there's a lot of ancillary features with, you know, better, not just reducing carbon footprint, of course, but with, you know, better control, less operating costs, less maintenance. So a lot of these things, it's not like you're like substituting something for something worse. I see a lot of this, the same thing as the benefits of going from like an incandescent light bulb to an LED bulb, where it's just like, it's all pluses. It's like less energy, better light quality, better control, better dimming. Um, so do you know that with electrification, a good way to be thinking about it, it's really, there's no like harm in doing this. You're not going to be losing anything. Oftentimes it's a one for one substitute and there's going to be a lot of ancillary benefits. And I see the same thing is true also with uh, what we're going to be talking about today related with how we're heating, heating our home, how we're cooling our home, how we're using domestic hot water in our home. So traditionally with burning fossil fuels, not only are we sending all of that byproduct outside into the atmosphere and treating it like an open sewer, but the other big benefit is it's like you're removing a harmful deadly gas in a lot of cases. So I saw that um, you know, 80% of the people on this webinar right now are doing are heating with um, natural gas. So removing that out of the home, it's going to make it safer. It's going to um, and it's going to be a lot cleaner too. Um, so we have two different technologies that we're going to be kind of focusing on today. One's air source heat pumps, the other solar thermal. Uh, and with both of these technologies combined, it's going to be a huge reduction in someone's overall carbon footprint. And both of the types of equipment is 100% market ready. It works and a lot of us uh, have already adopted it. The company that I work for, we're about energy management. I guess if we were to have a claim to fame, uh, we oversee the vast majority of the home performance contractors working in the Mass Safe program. So we just make sure that all the contractors are playing by the rules and all of the work executed is meeting the program standards. Uh, we've done a lot of work with a lot of municipalities related to heat pump adoption. Uh, so what we're trying to do is make sure that everyone understands the technology, that contractors understand the technology, that the systems that are being proposed are going to be appropriate for the homeowner and for their home and their goals with the project. Uh, and we just kind of uh, provide services where we really do try to serve as like a homeowner's rep in the process. So we figure out what people are trying to do when it comes to heat pumps. We uh, review quotes in detail. We help people understand system performance. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the sum of the um, uh, what we do as a company. The goal with the Cambridge program, it very much follows along that goal with the rest of the municipalities that we work in. Um, yeah, it's just really trying to make sure that customers know what they're getting, are happy with what they're getting, and the equipment that's being proposed is going to serve that purpose. Um, and uh, I guess just a little bit more about me. Um, so I ran over a thousand massive energy audits. I've trained over a hundred uh, massive energy auditors. Uh, I've done some speaking regarding heat pumps. 
Uh, I'll likely mention anecdotes about my own home threat and my own experience with my own ductless system, uh, but I have a 2,800 square foot home. Uh, it was built over a hundred years ago. I fully buttoned it up, taking full advantage of mass save. Uh, and that really did help impact my system design as well as my install costs with bringing my heat load way, way down. Um, I recently did a solar project as well, and I recently also signed up for 100% renewables um, from a third-party supplier that's somewhat uh, reputable, like the City of Cambridge's program as well. All right, let's get to it. Um, so I wanted to start with this. Um, I, I, some of you may have seen this article, it's perfectly fine if you didn't, but the Boston Globe recently ran an article about how short the state was as far as the adoption of uh, heat pump technology. Uh, and throughout the article, it's very well written. Uh, they did bring up some, I think, notable quotes. So I'm just gonna read through a few of these because I think for a lot of people, this may be the starting place that you may be thinking about with the technology. And it could in fact be a starting place that your home energy auditor may say, or your HVAC contractor. So we're gonna talk about these things and then we're gonna kind of get into a lot of data and just try to understand the technology and how it really performs. So I'll read this one. <laughs> At MassSave, uh, the reluctance is hiding in plain sight. Some homeowners said contractors affiliated with MassSave dissuaded them from removing their fossil fuel system and going all electric. Next one. Some residents said, uh, said that as they thought to convert their home off fossil fuel, contractors, including those associated with MassSave's energy audit program, told them that heat pumps alone could not heat adequately throughout a Massachusetts winter. And then the last one, um, uh, out of five contractors he spoke with, only one was comfortable fully converting his oil burning heating system to heat pumps. So just know that if you are interested in pursuing this, this is going to be some of the things, some of the information that you are going to be hearing. So let's start with talking about how a heat pump actually works. And um, this is the first time that I've done this, okay? So we are gonna go and take a look what we got over here. So over here, what we got, we got some water over here and some more water over here. And I have an infrared camera right over here. So if we look over here, we could see that this water is 32 degrees. And we could see that this water, at least when I set it out, was much hotter than this, but this is 94 degrees, 95 degrees, okay? So one of the things that will be important as we are thinking about this first, uh, sorry, the second law of thermodynamics is that hot goes to cold. Okay, so for example, with the ice water that I have over here, the warmth of the room is eventually going to get absorbed into this ice and absorbed into this water and it will melt the ice. And during that process, phase change happens and it actually ends up absorbing a lot of energy from the room. Now over here with the hot water that I have, this hot water will eventually become warm water. So the heat inside of this water will eventually go out into the room. So, it's weird doing a webinar not getting nods, but I hope that everyone understands that part. All right, let's see what else we got. We have a can of compressed air and we got the infrared camera over here. And I wanna just highlight over here, if we go and look at this can of compressed air, it's gonna be 74, 73 degrees. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to see that. 74 degrees, okay. I'm gonna put this down for a second. Okay, I'm gonna uh, let's see where we're at now. Huh, 51 degrees. So that's a little weird. So all that I did over here is I just released the pressure in the can, okay? Now, this is going to be another huge thing with building science and thermodynamics, okay? And it's this principle. As you decrease the pressure, which I just did, it's going to decrease the temperature. And if I were to increase the pressure, which I can't do by pulling that trigger, I need a compressor in a factory to do it. If I increase the pressure in that can, 
I would then increase the temperature. So now if we go and we look at this picture over here, let's just think about what we would have. So we're gonna have an outdoor unit and the outdoor unit is referred to in a heat pump as an outdoor unit. If it was a central AC, it'd be known as a compressor. So let's pretend it's a central AC for a moment. How this unit's going to work is it's going to take refrigerant, it's gonna compress the heck out of it and it's gonna make it super duper hot. So let's just pretend that it heats it up to 120 degrees and outside's 95 degrees. 120 is a lot warmer than 90. So that 120 degree refrigerant is gonna to wanna to release its energy to the outside air. And that's what the fan's for, is just to help quickly transfer the energy off of those coils. Now that the uh, refrigerant may be like 95 degrees, it just drops the pressure. Now that refrigerant becomes super duper cool and it brings it inside. And then air from inside passes over that now cold refrigerant, which could be at 60 degrees. And it's going to take the house that was at 80 degrees and maybe make it 76 degrees. And that's how a AC works. A heat pump works the exact same way, but it can flip it in reverse. So in the winter time, say zero degrees is wicked cold, but it's way warmer than negative 30 degrees. So there's still like 30 degrees worth of uh, energy inside of that air. So if you could have negative 30 degree refrigerant going, going over zero degree air, that negative 30 degree refrigerant would absorb a ton of energy from that outside air. It compresses the heck out of it, makes it super hot. Now the uh, refrigerant going inside could be like 80 degrees. And then uh, the room goes from 68 degrees to 70 degrees. The refrigerant goes back outside, drops the pressure. Now it's wicked cold again and again and again and again until your house is nice and comfortable. So that is kind of the long and short of how a heat pump works. Uh, for people who just want a quick answer about how a heat pump works, it works great. And we'll be exploring why that's true uh, very shortly. So. Heat pumps work by using electricity to move heat from one location outside to another location inside in the winter time, in the reverse, in the summertime. Traditional electric heat just uses electricity through a resistant metal element to generate heat. And that's true for a toaster oven, a blow dryer, um, <laughs> or an electric space heater that you would find at Walmart or at Home Depot. So when a heat pump is using electricity to move energy or to pump energy from one location to another, it ends up being wildly more efficient. So that factor of efficiency is referred to as the coefficient of performance. And for us who's kind of like plugged into the space, this is one of those numbers that we really hone in on. So let's just figure out with this one particular model, which is one that I own, um, how good it is. So say at 47 degrees right over here, you it's 47 degrees outside and you want your house to be 70 degrees. You put in one unit of electricity into this unit, four units of heat, say it's 17 degrees outside. Now there's less energy in the air than at 47. So it's going to drop. So at 17 degrees, you put in one unit of electricity, 2.64 units of heat out of this. At five degrees, the least efficient that the system will run, one unit of electricity in, two units of heat out. And at negative 15 degrees outside, you're putting in one unit of electricity, you're still going to be getting out 1.8 units of heat. So these are kind of the big things that get people like excited about heat pumps is it just, <laughs> In some ways, it's like magical because with a traditional fossil fuel based system, let's say natural gas, the most efficient natural gas system, you put in one unit of energy, you're losing at least 3% of that to the atmosphere. With most natural gas based systems, they're closer to like 85% efficient. So if those were to have a COP, it'd be 0.85 versus a heat pump, which could be four. <laughs> Um, so they're wildly more efficient on paper than a traditional fossil fuel based system. But there's two factors to be thinking about. One, where are electricity is coming from? 
And two, how much kind of distribution losses is from the generation source to your home? And that's kind of what some of the equalizers are in regards to pricing. So um, what does this all look like in practice? This chart's gonna need a little bit of explanation, but I just want you to focus on the gray section right now. So the gray section right over here is gonna be following this axis. And this is the number of hours in Boston that we spend at each temperature. So say at 60 degrees over the course of the year, we spend eh, 190 hours at that temperature. Say at 32 degrees, yeah, about 190 hours at that temperature. But say at 14 degrees, yeah, it looks like only like 30 hours at that temperature. So one thing that you could be thinking about with the heat pump is like, should I be sizing it for the whole year or should I be sizing it for part of the year? And the other thing that I think that this is kind of interesting when you are just looking at the gray line, it's like, oh, well, it doesn't seem like most of what we're spending, uh, most of the time that we're spending over the course of the year is above freezing. Um, it's on the warmer side. So maybe we like thinking about a heating system isn't that big of a deal. But one thing that we know is the temperature goes down, the delta T between like what we want the house to be to what the outside is, is really great. So there's kind of, as the temperature drops, there's higher and higher energy demands. So now we can just go and look at the other color lines. So the other color lines, yellow is gonna be electric resistance, purple is gonna be propane, black is home heating oil, green is an air source heat pump that's well-designed, and blue is natural gas. And if we're going and following the axis over at this side, we could see exactly what that heat pump that I showed you earlier would cost at every single degree. So we could see, just with looking very quickly at this chart, whoa, Air source heat pumps are so much more efficient than electric resistance at its functioning coefficient of performance at each of these temperatures. Whoa, it's so much more efficient than propane. It's cheaper than home heating oil all the way down to 12 degrees. But say at 12 degrees, anything less than that, it's like next to comparable. So probably should get off of home heating oil. But when we do go and we look at natural gas, it's a little trickier. Yes, at these warmer temperatures, the air source heat pump may be a bit more efficient than natural gas, but as the temperature does begin to drop, there does become a slightly bigger uh, gap between those two technologies. But one of the things <laughs> is um, commodity prices do change. So these are what is today. So with a kilowatt hour of electricity, 23 cents, a therm of natural gas, $1.55. Oh, and one thing that I said, the, and it's good that there's so many people with gas bills <laughs> paying gas on here right now is because I uh, made this chart based off of roughly $1,000 um, a year in annual gas heating costs. So I do wanna just show that like, if you were to switch from natural gas, which in Massachusetts today is the cheapest way to heat your home over to air source heat pumps, it really is well within the margin of error all the way down to <laughs> the very low temperatures all the way down to the negatives because at those extremely low temperatures, there's so few hours at that range that it really doesn't matter. What matters when we're thinking about the coefficient of performance and the efficiency of the heat pump and how much it's gonna cost you, it's really in this range over here from like 17 degrees all the way down to all the way up to 60 degrees. Like that's the range that we should be thinking about the efficiency, the sizing of an air source heat pump. So that's cost, but let's talk about why I'm excited about air source heat pumps in the city of Cambridge as well. This is related to the pounds of CO2 equivalents that each of the different fuels would be releasing every single year. And it's not even close. At this point, it's like natural gas and air source heat pumps, those were within the margin of error. But when you're just looking at CO2, it's not even close. There's only one winner over here and that's going to be using a heat pump to be generating electricity. This is taking into account that we're still tied to our grid, 70% natural gas. It's, um, but you putting in that like 
see that coefficient of performance, it's just such a multiplier for reducing emissions way, way down. And one thing that's also true is every single year, our grid is getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. But that's only part of the story. As was mentioned before with the city of Cambridge, they have a community aggregation for generating electricity. Uh, so they're buying 100% wind, 100% uh, uh, all wind, all solar to be reducing the emissions with this program to zero. So let's just go and see what that would look like. Well, now look, we've completely decarbonized and completely electrified our HVAC. Now, when we're thinking about our carbon footprint, it's nothing with switching over to a heat pump. Um, so you may be thinking like, well, this is going to be expensive, but I put in Cambridge rates into my calculator over here and it's really not that much different. It's still cheaper than every single other fuel other than natural gas. Yeah, it may be a little bit different, uh, but when you are looking at kind of the hours, it's like, all right, yeah, 32 degrees instead of it being, you know, $38, it's $43. It's not a huge jump. Um, so I do think that it's definitely worth exploring this technology, exploring Cambridge's community aggregation program as well. Um, so why do people like heat pumps other than the fact that it's like a really good, easy way to be reducing emissions? One, they're wildly quiet compared to other types of systems. Um, so that's both inside the home as well as outside the home. So a traditional uh, central AC, those are typically running 75, 80 decibels with a heat pump um, from particular manufacturers like the Asian manufacturers of like Mitsubishi, Fujitsu, Daikin, LG. Uh, those are uh, typically closer to 50 decibels, which is extremely important because Cambridge does have um, sound ordinances. And if you are wanting to use your heat pump as your sole source of heat, if you do, um, <laughs> if you uh, if you do decide to kind of go with a dual fuel type of a heat pump, like a heat pump sitting on top of an oil furnace or a gas furnace, we may be bumping into a bit of trouble because uh, those systems do run a lot higher. The indoor units for ductless, you can hear them running, but it's uh, it's really no louder than like a box fan on low. So there is a fan and there is a motor over there, uh, but they're extremely quiet on the inside. So depending on the speed, anywhere between uh, 20, 20 on low, 30 on medium and 40 decibels on high. They're wildly efficient. So with a standard window AC, those would be around a 10 sear. With a single, with a multi-zone ductless system, that's a 20 sear. And sear is like seasonal energy efficiency ratio. But what this means is let's say that over the course of the summertime, you spend $600 with window ACs at a 10 sear. If you jump over to a 20 sear system, it would be $300, it cuts it in half. Some single zone ductless systems uh, have up to sear, uh, they're over sear 30. Um, so that would be uh, cutting it in half once and then cutting it in half again. Um, so then that would be uh, $200, um, $200 instead of $600 on cooling costs. Um, first, a central AC, like an Energy Star central AC is around a CR14. So that with ductless equipment or ducted heat air source heat pumps, uh, typically wildly more efficient than uh, traditional systems. And then the other thing that's huge is um, with heat pumps, air source heat pumps, you can do extremely precise zoning. So it's very common. So I saw some people with steam, steam system, usually the whole home's on one zone with forced hot water, um, which it looked like 60% of people were. It's probably a zone per floor, but with air source heat pumps, you can zone individual rooms or you can zone different sections of the house and you can get everywhere exactly where you want it to be. So if someone likes sleeping in 64 degree weather and someone else likes sleeping in 68 degree weather, uh, that's totally uh, a real possibility with air source heat pumps on the heating side. And then on the cooling side, some people don't like central AC, but they do like all the moisture removed from the room. So like one person can have their unit on dry mode, which is just removing the humidity while someone else could have their bedroom like a nice spot. So the, what, 
it's a deeper discussion that I'd like to have as far as like, uh, should you be doing this or how you should be zoning? And there's no right or wrong way to be thinking about these. You could be thinking about them just in the way of like, I want these to make my home most comfortable. Uh, and that's one design or another design is, I want this system to run using the least amount of energy as possible. Uh, and I'm happy to have both of those discussions and work with you and contractors with finding the right design. What does a heat pump look like? Um, so the, they, there's two types and we'll get to the next type on the next slide, but there's ductless, which means that there's no ducts. And there's ducted, which means that there's usually sheet metal running, uh, running through a basement or down through an attic or through a knee wall space or side attic space into a room. These are ductless units. They're extremely easy for contractors to install. So they more or less punch a hole through an exterior wall or down through a floor into a basement and out. Uh, or there are some models that can even fit up into a ceiling. Uh, I'll give a little bit of nuance about each of these. And uh, two of these three photos are from my own home. So with the ductless units, what's nice about these uh, is it doesn't take up any floor space. Um, what is not great about these is it does usually need to be on exterior walls. So that could affect some of the design. And one of the things is when they are on exterior walls is you do end up with like a gutter like material called the line hide that's running from the unit down pretty much to the base of your house and over to the outdoor unit. So it will affect, you know, some of the architectural integrity potentially of your house. The floor mounts, if I were to do my own ductless project all over again, I would have opted for more of these units versus the wall hung units. What I like about these is the temperature that it's reading for heating mode, it's down lower, it's not up high. So it does do a better job, I think, with accurately like reading the temperature in the space and heating it. The other thing that I really like about it, I have a hundred year old home, I have cast iron column radiators. I'm used to heating elements that are kind of like down there and outside of eye level. So I do think for Cambridge, where there is a lot of like historical intrigue with the interior and exterior design, I think these floor mounts are, are a really great way to go. Instead of having all of the line sets running through the exterior, it's typically dropping down into the basement and then straight up. So I think it's a cleaner install. And I also like that you don't have to get up on a step ladder uh, to change the filter and keep it clean. With ceiling cassettes, I wish that they were more of a marketplace reality, but do know that uh, for, the for most manufacturers, it's this type of a unit and they're like 20 by 20. And that's problematic because most of our framing is 16 inches on center. So these aren't really necessarily like a drop in for a lot of retrofits for new construction or renovation, uh, not a problem whatsoever. Um, they do have these types of units, like Mitsubishi makes one, Samsung makes one, where it does fit 16 inches on center. There is a little bit of a premium to the product. And then if it's in the ceiling, it just is a lot harder for the crews to be able to run, run the line set. So there is oftentimes a bit of a premium on price, but if that's what works for your home, uh, that's what's going to work for your home. The ducted heat pumps are awesome because one of the things, it may not look like it, but say this wall hung unit, the smallest one from my manufacturer, which was Fujitsu, is 7,000 BTUs. The bedroom that it, it is in probably needs about 3,000 BTUs. So that unit has almost doubled the capacity that that room would ever need, even on the coldest day of the year. So how do I design around that? It's like, all right, well, it'll be doing the bedroom and it will also be doing my daughter's room, even though it's not directly blowing into that space. So that's kind of one of the, if you're thinking about designing these things for efficiency, that's one of the things to kind of keep in mind is you do wanna match the equipment load to the zone. You don't have to worry about those types of compromises, both in comfort as well as efficiency with ducted. So with ducted, I could have this unit and that could be in an attic. And then I could have one branch of the ductwork going to my room, one branch of the ductwork going over to my daughter's room. 
And now that 7,000 BTU ducted heat pump matches the load perfectly. And now both of those rooms don't have anything hanging on the wall that could be affecting, you know, the interior design sensibility of uh, someone living in there. So with ducted heat pumps, they have different sizes. There's kind of small where it's just going to be like handling two rooms. There's a medium static unit that could be handling an entire floor. And then there's also central heat pumps, and that could be handling an entire house. If anyone on this webinar has a central AC system, this type of a product right here that my mouse is hovering over is like such a good solution. It's like a swap out the central AC, swap in the heat pump, and you've just figured out how to, how to electrify the, your entire home. There's people who are always concerned about redundancy and resiliency and what happens if there's an ice storm or a polar vortex or a snow apocalypse. And with this type of a unit, it can even have an electric resistant element as backup. One thing that other people are, and this is what like the mass save contractors were talking about in the Globe article. This is what a lot of people have liked to see in the past, but I don't think that it's needed from what we looked at with that temperature data because we don't need to really worry about negatives is this type of a unit. So this is gonna be like a gas furnace, highly efficient, as far as efficient that gas would be. And there could be a heat pump that just sits on top of it. This type of a central heat pump, uh, what it can do is these types of heat pumps typically, uh, will, sorry, we'll get to a capacity drop off in a bit. But um, what, how a lot of people configure these or a lot of contractors configure these will run the heat pump anytime that it's above 32 degrees and anytime it's below 32 degrees, we will run the gas furnace. So just know for ducted heat pumps, there's a wide variety of um, different options and these central heat pumps, whether 100% electric or dual fuel, are these one for one swap outs for what people have traditionally been using. So uh, can a heat pump really be used in our climate? And this is what I have to say about this. So like a rose is a rose is a rose, or a BTU is a BTU is a BTU is a BTU. It doesn't, and a BTU, by the way, is a British thermal unit, and that's how HVAC systems are measured with their heating capacity. So it doesn't matter if it's a furnace, if it's a steam boiler, if it's a hydronic boiler, or if it's a heat pump. This unit could be 80,000 BTUs or 60,000 BTUs or 40,000 BTUs. Whatever the label is, it's what it is gonna be. Same thing with the steam boiler. This is probably 120,000 BTUs. What does it put out? 120,000 BTUs. This heat pump over here could be a 12,000 BTU heat pump or could be a 48,000 BTU heat pump. Whatever it is, that's how much energy it's going to be putting out. Now, there is this concept, okay? So there's heat pumps and then there's cold climate heat pumps with no capacity drop-off. And the no capacity drop-off depends on manufacturers, but it's usually to sub-zero temperatures. So over here is Bosch, which is from uh, a European manufacturer. That unit runs down to negative 22. It maintains 100% of its capacity down to negative five. So that means if it's a 36,000 BTU heat pump, at negative four degrees, it's still a 36,000 BTU heat pump. But say at negative 21 degrees, it will have lost some of its capacity. But we'll go back to the chart where we go and look how many hours Cambridge faces at what temperature, and we can ask ourselves, is this a big deal? Or is this a big enough deal that I wanna still be using fossil fuels? And it's a question that I'm happy to explore with all of you. And it's one of the reasons why Cambridge is doing this because it is a little bit nuanced and some people need to really feel assured before making the investment that this equipment's gonna work. But traditionally it's like the Asian manufacturers that have this equipment, Mitsubishi, Fujitsu, Daikin, um, 
those are the type of uh, manufacturers that you'd want to explore. So let's just think about this and what it means for a home. So over here, I have a chart, okay? And I have two different types of heat pumps. The orange one is going to be from, a, let's say a traditional American manufacturer. So we'll say this is carrier. So we're gonna look at this heat pump and we'll see at 60 degrees, this heat pump can put out 48,000 BTUs, okay? And then by the time it reaches 40 degrees, it may only be able to put out 42,000 BTUs. With a traditional heat pump, what would happen is by the time we reach, I don't know, 17 degrees, it may only have 20,000 BTUs. So that's kind of the curve of performance. That heat pump starts up high and it loses capacity as it goes. And if we look at the home at 70 degrees outside, you don't need any BTUs. 70 degrees outside, it's gonna be 70 degrees inside. It's gonna be perfectly comfortable. But say for this particular home and its particular thermal envelope, say in Cambridge, with the design temperature being around five degrees, at five degrees, this home is gonna need 42,000 BTUs per hour to be able to keep up with the energy being lost. So this traditional heat pump will look and say, mm, this isn't gonna work so well because this heat pump is only gonna be able to heat my home to like 26 degrees. And after that, it's gonna start getting colder and colder and colder in there. This cold climate heat pump without a capacity drop off. And we can see what, I can pull up many models that have this type of performance. This starts off at offering 48,000 BTUs. At zero degrees, it's still 48,000 BTUs. And it's only once we're reaching the negatives that its capacity starts to fall. And it looks like it falls to, you know, 36,000 BTUs. So let's just say that the house does continue along this curve it could become problematic if there was a polar vortex, but the heat pump isn't going to quit on that house. Um, so that is something to be keeping in mind. Oh, and one of the things to be keeping in mind, and I don't think I can make this big anymore, is if we did go back and we looked at this chart that's down here, which shows like the cost of each system at each temperature, we would see that actually having a heat pump at 26 degrees, which would have been like somewhere right around here on the curve, that's still displacing a large amount of carbon. So if you are speaking with a contractor and he's like, well, you got a brand new gas furnace, but you're old R22 central AC is dead, there's nothing wrong with just sizing the capacity of the heat pump to replace the old central AC, and you're still displacing the vast majority of uh, your carbon. So is it a way to completely electrify you? No, but I drive a Prius and I feel really good that I'm getting twice the miles per gallon, uh, per gallon of gas. And I would think that the traditional heat pumps from all the American manufacturers is uh, not a horrible way to go if it is just kind of a stopgap or a, you know, kind of something between two generations related to the technology. So let's just think a little bit about BTUs of a structure of a home and a heat pump. So over here, I have three different houses. So I have a leaky farmhouse, I have a post-World War II Cape, and I got a high-performance home. Even if all of these were all the same square footage, which it doesn't look like they are in these photos, one of these homes could have an extremely low load per hour, like 24,000 BTUs. Well, one of them could have 100,000 BTUs per hour. So if we were to go and stick with this concept of a 48,000 BTU heat pump and what can it do? Well, it doesn't matter if it's a cold climate heat pump or a traditional heat pump. If we go and we think about this home or this home, well, this 48,000 BTU heat pump isn't gonna meet the design temperature. It's not enough capacity. It doesn't matter that the capacity drops. One thing that is interesting though, and I think this is huge with thinking about mass save and energy efficiency, there's nothing that's stopping this 50,000 BTU home from becoming a 30,000 BTU home or a 24,000 BTU home, or working with a passive house consultant and getting it less than a 12,000 BTU home. So none of these things are fixed as far as what your load is. And it's really easy in older Cambridge homes to significantly bring down the heat load. 
if the walls aren't insulated and you insulate all the walls, that's probably going to be taking off like 20,000 BTUs of the building. Replace single pane windows with storm, probably just removed another 15,000 BTUs that would be required for your heat pump to handle. So while we are talking about electrifying today, I do think this general concept of decarbonizing, just using less energy, is just as equally important. Um, how much do they cost? So this is uh, this is tricky to say because every contractor will have a different price. So let's just say there's uh, you get five quotes all for Mitsubishi contractors, all asking for a uh, single zone twenty four thousand BTU wall hung unit. One could be coming in with a price of five thousand dollars, while one could be coming in at a price of nine thousand dollars. So. Uh, people are going to charge what they want to charge based off of how busy they are, based off of their reputation, based off of if they have a sales staff, service team, install team, uh, back end in the office. Uh, all of those things do contribute into the price of how much these things cost. So on average, with just putting in a single unit size for the heat load of the space, yeah, probably like four to six thousand dollars. And there's nothing wrong with doing this as a design. It's how anyone who heats with a wood stove or a pellet stove heats. There's going to be one central emitter, and you set it to what you want to set it at. And where where the unit is is going to be wildly comfortable. And as you get further away from the unit, it may end up becoming uncomfortable. It really depends on how well the home is insulated. There's nothing wrong with doing this as approach and there's also nothing wrong with starting small and seeing how you like the heat pump before going big and doing it for the rest of the house do you know you put in one heat pump for this type of a space you you've just you've pretty much uh, guaranteed have uh, put in a amazing cooling and dehumidifying system for that space so don't think of this technology solely as heating one ductless unit its ability to cool and remove moisture from a space is absolutely excellent. Now, this is another approach that some people will take for a heat pump. And, you know, it's, uh, I have four cast iron radiators in my home. I want four ductless units in the home. And the big problem with this is that home needed four giant cast iron radiators when it was originally built when the walls were uninsulated, when there's large gaps in field stones, the ceiling was uninsulated, you've probably replaced the windows, you've probably insulated the walls, you've probably buttoned up the basement. So all of the, 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 the need for an emitter in each and every room, it's likely not the reality today. This ends up with a system that's wildly oversized and it also becomes pretty expensive because I'm showing a pretty simple floor plan over here. And there's lots of people I'm sure on the call that live in two bedroom apartments in Cambridge or two bedroom condos. So that's fair to think that this is the type of price range that you're gonna see. But for all of, uh, all of the people on here that are in a single family home that may have two stories with four bedrooms and a dining room, a foyer, a living room, it's like now your HVAC project is now up to $40,000 because you're looking at eight indoor units. So that's, I don't think also necessarily the best approach. What we'd like to see as far as efficiency, interior design, uh, keeping the price a little bit honed in is like this is approach. It's like put one ductless unit in the common, in the common areas, put a ducted unit, in the two bedrooms, there's no reason that that couldn't also be dumping into the bathroom. And just a note with the bathroom, this bathroom over here without an emitter in it is gonna be perfectly fine. There's no windows in this space. There's only five feet of exterior wall versus all of this interior wall. So like ooh, bathrooms are, <laughs> it's worth having a conversation about, about whether it'll be problematic to not have a unit directly blowing in there, but this one is gonna be really good. This is, um, this is the design that I think that is really kind of the, the reality for helping people move forward with these types of projects. So let's go with two units. So the unit in the main space, 
why don't we have this? We'll always keep the fan on high, have that blow down the hallway into this bedroom. It's going to be picking up the entirety of the load over here. And then for the master bedroom over here, they can have their own ductless unit as well. And if this heat load was like 24,000 BTUs, we'll have this one as you know, uh, 8,000 BTUs and this one, uh, this one is 16,000 BTUs to kind of split up uh, the capacity of the units and really try and match the space. So when I am thinking about proposals and helping people understand their quotes, the, when I do see designs like this, I typically think that this is the, the right approach with kind of honing in the budget and uh, meeting all the comfort uh, comfort goals that people are going to have with actually living with this. Um, we talked about the Cambridge aggregation program before, but do know that um, uh, with Cambridge, they do help with adopting rooftop solar. Rooftop solar is amazing in Massachusetts because we have a thing called net metering, which means when we're not using electricity, we sell it to the grid. And then we get a buy it back from the grid at the same exact price that we ended up selling it for. And what that means is it, it's, uh, it makes uh, PV really attractive. And it's really attractive because the price of the technology keeps falling. So about 12 years ago is about $8 per watt. And then as recently as like three years ago, we're still hovering around $4 a watt. With my own solar project, I ended up going with Tesla. I was $2 a watt for my solar. What that means is I only got a 4KW system, but it cost $8,000. After tax credits, after uh, smart payments, it's gonna cost me out of pocket about $5,000. Over the life of the system, and I know I may need to replace an inverter, maybe on year 12 out of the 20 year life, I'm going to be offsetting about $18,000 worth of electricity if it's locked in at today's prices. So it's an absolute no brainer. So if we remember that margin of error with how close natural gas was to air source heat pumps, well, if you put in kind of like the multiply these things out by 20 years and put in the solar project in there, and then not all the electricity you're needing to buy from the grid at retail cost, but all of your net metering credits that you're getting back for free, it just makes this such a win for this technology. And um, just knowing that you're generating that electricity right off your roof feels very good. Uh, with COVID, they ended up extending the solar tax credit. So 26% of the total project cost you get back. Um, so as long as you have the tax liability and then $1,000 back from the state and then um, smart payments from the utilities um, and then net metering. So a lot of really, 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 really good incentives um, for solar PV. And one thing I, I did have to cut all of the mass save incentives because everything's changing in 2022 and it's all going to get likely a lot better. They haven't finalized that and everything now, um, but do know that the projects, they do take a little bit of time to like get quotes, get an install date. Uh, so I wouldn't, knowing that the incentives are going to change in 2022, I wouldn't put a pause in beginning to explore this technology now and start building up quotes for air source heat pumps. Um, but yeah, check out Sunny Cambridge. They'll get you in touch with Energy Sage. They help connect co uh, customers with local third party uh, solar installers. Um, and it really is a super great way of exploring the technology. Um, I've spoken a lot about air source heat pumps. I do wanna just touch about domestic hot water. So domestic hot water, it's the water used in like showering, washing your dishes, washing your clothes, which should be on cold. Um, so just the hot water that's coming out of the faucet. Air source heat pumps for that technology is very much a reality. There's two different types. One's called package and one's called split. So the split one over here, it's an emerging technology here in Massachusetts. So the unit is outside and then there's gonna be refrigerant lines running from the outdoor unit into this domestic hot water heater and it's heating up the domestic hot water. Same exact way an air source heat pump would be heating up your home. With the package units, it's a little bit more nuanced. It's going to just be a heat pump sitting right on top of the domestic hot water heater. And that's going to be stealing heat from the basement, likely, or a utility closet, 
an unconditioned area in your home, ideally, and it's going to be taking that energy and dumping it into the domestic hot water and then spitting out cold air. Now, you may be thinking, that doesn't sound good. Wouldn't this cause my pipes to freeze? I have a few thoughts on this. One of the byproducts of this technology, as it is removing the heat from the outside air or the basement air, it's also pulling out all of that humidity. In my own home, which isn't high performance by any means, I have significant problems managing the relative humidity in my basement. It's always at above 70%. If I had this type of technology, it would solve that problem and I wouldn't need to be running a dehumidifier about it. So while stealing heat from a basement some portion of the year may be unfavorable, stealing moisture from the basement air over the entire course of the year is typically very favorable in most New England homes. So there's a few things to be thinking about with this. One, if you are worried about pipes freezing, you can, these units, instead of being called packaged, are also called hybrid. And you can actually turn off the heat pump and turn on just the electric resistance elements if you're really concerned about that. And the other great thing about this technology is if there's not enough heat in the ambient air to steal, it'll automatically use the electric resistant elements to be able to make it up. Um, so good technology. Let's say all of that seems way too much and way too confusing and there's way too much nuance out on it. Um, solar thermal is awesome. Uh, the, it works great in New England. Um, the, there's two different types of this. Oh, well, let me start with the key thing. It typically displaces, depending on the number of the panels, about 70% of the amount of energy that's required to heat up domestic hot water. So for example, if you were to be spending like $400 a year for heating up your domestic hot water and you put a solar thermal collector on, on that system with a drain back design, it'd be like $100 or $150. It has a dramatic reduction in the amount of energy that's required to do it because the sun's doing all the hard work. Two different types of collectors. There's flat plate collectors, evacuated tubes, these guys uh, down at the bottom, they're a bit more expensive, they're a bit more efficient, um, but the contractors that work in the metro area, one's called New England Solar Hot Water, one's called Res Renewable Energy Systems, they're both absolutely awesome. Um, very great contractors, I think, compared to the reputation most contractors have. So I really think that it's worth exploring because um, they will give you exactly what these systems would be able to produce off of your rooftop. Um, there's a new technology as well called the solar assisted heat pump. So instead of having panels on your roof or having an outdoor compressor that's spinning and you know transferring heat off of the refrigerant, um, there's just this flat plate collector and that's just picking up radiation from the ground, from the sun. It's bringing that refrigerant in, it's compressing the heck out of it, making it super hot, heating up the domestic hot water. Uh, so this is a new emerging technology that's pretty, pretty exciting as well. If your roof is already covered in uh, PV panels or you have a rubber roof or a tar and gravel roof and you know you're gonna be replacing it, you know, rather shortly, but you still want to be doing something with domestic hot water, these panels being mounted on the side of the home could be the perfect solution. Um, so that's all of my like building science stuff. Uh, I'm going to go kick it back over to Ryan and uh, he can uh, take it from here, but I'll uh, be seeing you guys in the Q&A session. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, lots of information. So uh, if you could go to the next slide, we'll touch on what your next step should be for digesting that information and, and turning it into a reality for your own home or apartment. Um, so really, the first place to begin is scheduling a consultation with Mike or one of Abode's other heat pump specialists. Uh, that'll be an opportunity to talk for 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, you can talk about your home, get more information on heat pump 101. Think about the specific configuration and layout of your home and what types of equipment might work best. Uh, we do also offer services for comparing quotes. If you have multiple quotes from different contractors and you need help digesting those or comparing them apples to apples, we're happy to take a look at those with you and help think through what might meet your, uh, your goals and your needs best. And you are also welcome to schedule multiple consultations over the course of your project. 
they're all at no cost to you and we're happy to re-engage as you continue to progress through the program. Uh, our goal is to make sure that you're installing systems with confidence and that those systems will meet your goals and also the, the goals of Cambridge with reducing its um, carbon impact. So you can schedule a consultation by going to the Cambridge Clean Heating and Cooling website. That's cambridgecleanheat.org. Uh, you'll see this big flashy pop-up box where you can start. Um, there's also a specific web page that you can go to at Abode's website, abode.energy slash consultation. And Mike, if you could go to the next slide for me, please. You'll see here uh, three different uh, consultation options. So based on your goals, where you are, in your process, if you just click on the arrow here that best applies to what you're looking for, that will take you to a page here where you can actually select an appointment date and time on our calendar. Uh, after you click on a date here, you'll get a, a time range that you can select from, provide us with some information on your home and your goals, any context that you think we should know, and then we will, um, follow up at the time that you've selected. So that's the process for scheduling a consultation. I hope that you'll all take advantage of that. One other thing to touch on is that we do maintain a list of qualified contractors. And I was just typing out a response here regarding refrigerant leakage. Um, but one of the things that's important to consider is, is working with a qualified contractor who has experience installing this type of equipment, um, specifically this type of equipment and is sizing and designing it properly based on um, the home heating and cooling loads that'll it'll perform properly. So the main thing that we offer as far as that goes is a participating contractor list. These are contractors who've provided qualifications to us. We've checked their customer service track record, uh, and there's a you know an ongoing process of, of evaluating their performance to make sure that they're abiding by the program goals and, and meeting um, customers' needs. There are also a few other things here. I mean, word of mouth is always good, although again, um, heat pumps are complicated technology. You may not want to go with, you know, your neighborhood plumber who's been installing, um, you know, traditional HVAC equipment, unless they have specific expertise in heat pumps. Um, also the manufacturers. So for example, Mitsubishi, Fujitsu, uh, they all have their sort of certified contractor network. If you go on any one of their websites, you can enter your zip code or your location and it'll, it'll pop up with a list of the contractors who've gone through their manufacturer trainings for specifically installing their equipment. Um, I'll leave it to Mike on the Mass CEC public records. I don't know if that's worth touching on here. You can skip over that for the sake of getting to the Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask about it in the consultation. And here is our contact info. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I will just advocate for the, the consultation. If you have specific questions about your home or heat pump technology, I think the best way to go about asking those is in a consultation. Um, but we are happy to be a resource to you if you'd like to shoot us an email or anything like that, um, that, that works as well. So I think with that, we can take it to the q and We're running a little bit late here, but I did see some good questions in the chat and we're happy to stick around and, and answer anything that you have. So I think I'll go through the chat first, but if anyone has a question they'd like to answer or to ask out loud, if you could use the raise hand feature, we will start getting to those once we've made it through the chat questions. Just take a look at what we have here. Um, we have a question about why green energy is more expensive than gas. And I think that the context of that, Mike, was when you were talking about um, comparing you know, oil versus gas versus energy aggregation prices. Oh yeah, well it's, it's very much Massachusetts thing. Um, so if you go and look at like the national average of how much a kilowatt hour costs, it's closer to 17 cents with some states closer to 12 cents. Uh, with Massachusetts, we're either uh, uh, cursed or blessed without having coal fired power plants and mountains of coal, you know, in the Berkshires that have been ripped up and uh, sent into the atmosphere. So yeah, electricity is very expensive in Massachusetts because everything needs to get delivered either by uh, pipeline or uh, LNG tanker and stored and, com you know, and combusted and then um, transmitted throughout our region. And then also you with the the, the cleaner options too, we're, we're going to need to be investing in 
yeah, offshore went off of Martha's Vineyard or be bringing down a lot more uh, hydropower uh, for, from Canada. So yeah, our, our electricity prices aren't necessarily like super attractive for the technology. It does make it competitive, but that's one of the things why I am so excited about on-site renewables um, just because the price has fallen. We have the regulatory infrastructure net metering in place that just makes it an absolute no brainer. Um, but yeah, I can't, <laughs> I can't change the price of electricity, but just know that it is, um, it is very much competitive compared to natural gas, even when you are buying 100% renewable, either through the city of Cambridge's aggregation or community solar projects or through another like third party aggregator. Uh, Daniel is wondering about retrofitting heat pump equipment to a hydronic system. Yeah, um, air to water is very much a market reality in other parts of the world. The big thing is our emitters and our plumbing distribution systems aren't typically designed for it. So if you have cast iron radiators or baseboard radiators, those are looking for 180 degree water. With an air to water heat pump, it's much more uh, the emitters that are required is much more of a European style where it'd be like 120 to 140 degrees. We have those, but it's typically radiant floors. So if you already have European style wall hung radiators, uh, panel radiators, uh, then yeah, you're good to go with air source heat pump as long as all the plumbing is like home run. So like to the boiler, up or to the heat pump, to the emitter and right back down. But yeah, there's certainly some nuances. And also with air to water, the other thing it's like, yeah, it's a great way to heat, but you are losing half the benefit of a air to air heat pump and that's air conditioning and dehumidification. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm well versed in both, uh, but I haven't been able to get uh, yet any air to water projects over the finish line just because really no one has the right emitters and distribution set up for it. Thanks, Mike. Lyle has a question about whether it's you know justifiable to replace a high efficiency gas system that was just installed a couple of years ago. Um, sort of the trade-offs between the, the climate advantages versus the, the cost that's maybe a little bit hard to, to face. Yeah, and I totally get the you know the embodied carbon of you know putting together this gas furnace and putting it in the trash five years later when it still has 10 more years of life. Uh, so yeah, it's you nuanced. Know, it's like I think I would just start with you know just trying to find out a little bit more about you know the goals, how the existing equipment is actually performing, whether or not it's making the home comfortable, whether or not it's loud, noisy, making the neighbors upset. So yeah, usually with projects like that, you you do need some additional like ancillary benefits other than uh, other than that because you know there there's likely a lot of things that you could do for the environment for $15,000 that isn't just putting in a heat pump in your home. Um, so it really could be that $15,000 could be, you know, <laughs> it could be, you know, spent for upgrading to an EV. Or, um, so that's worth a consultation to like explore all of the nuances on that one. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, representative of a lot of different aspects of this is that everyone's home or apartment or whatever it may be is different. And Mike is more than happy to get into the weeds of it. Um, so again, just another plug there for, for scheduling a consultation. Um, we have a question here about the average duct size for ducted heat pump systems. And I think while you're at it, if you could just touch on maybe the, the use of existing duct work in a home for heat pumps. Yeah, so it's not, it's, so the, the, the problem with older ductwork, so say if it was originally like a gravity furnace down in the basement, like if your ductwork is 100 years old and it didn't even have a motor uh, involved to blowing the air, it's just relying on natural convection, it's probably not going to be a good solution with putting in a high efficiency heat pump into absolutely ancient, dirty, decrepit, leaky, uh, maybe asbestos wrapped ductwork. 
Um, so that's, yeah, that's all part of the discussion. But if there was, if the dark work was originally designed for a central AC system, it's usually perfectly adequate. And the big thing with why I said central AC is it is really important that it is insulated. So a lot of times when the ductwork was originally designed for a gas furnace and you put a heat pump in there and now you're using that thing for cooling, all of the ductwork in the summertime is gonna be, you know, soaking wet with condensation and rust out on you. So um, when ductwork is too small, which very well could be because the, say with a combustion-based system, you have a heat exchanger, it's gonna be like 350 degrees because you're burning fuel inside of it. And then the air from the house passes over that 350 degree heat exchanger. It sends out super hot, dry air into your home. Your thermostat reaches its set point and off. And then we peak in 20 minutes, 15 minutes or two hours, depending on like how well insulated the home is. With a heat pump, the heat exchanger inside of there is gonna be like 80 degrees or 90 degrees. So to get your house at temperature, it's gonna be needing to send the air through it for a much longer period of time. But if it's still not able to reach that set point, it's going to increase the fan speed in the, the electronically controlled motor at the unit. It's gonna increase the speed of the compressor outside to, uh, to send more refrigerant over there and it could get noisy. So that is one reason, real reason, why some HVAC installers, uh, they may be believers in heat pumps, but they're still wanting to put it on top of a traditional fossil fuel-based system to make sure that it doesn't get too noisy because it's not trying to send too much air over there. So uh, there, I do know some contractors that are really good about this discussion. Like they want to just install heat pumps, but they also want people to be happy with their equipment. And so then therefore they're happy to talk about redoing all the duct work for $20,000 or also happy to, you know, talk to someone about a dual fuel system because you still will be displacing likely over, you know, be able to run that heat pump for over half of the, you know, heating season or heating degree hours. Um, so yeah, nuance, nuance in that one too. We have some more questions here in chat. One is about upcoming incentives in 2022 through mass save or otherwise yeah the um so that uh well we will know we will know soon we will know that they're going to be significantly better at least for natural gas customers today i do think that they're going to stop playing winners and losers with fossil fuels so right now if you're like oil propane or electric resistance you get like a $1,250 rebate per ton, but if you have natural gas, it's only $250. I do see that disparity likely disappearing because we need to get people off of all fossil fuels as quickly as possible. It seems like the scientific consensus says that uh, as soon as possible. So. Um, I imagine that disparity going away. I don't know if it's going to be $1,250 per ton, depending on the fuel or if they're going to put a cap. But one thing that MassSafe is going to get, I believe, much more real about um, making this technology affordable to lower and middle income households. So it, it is fair to assume that they, they will likely introduce some level of tiers as well um, to the incentives, but that's as much as I know. And we have uh, colleagues who are sitting in on all the meetings that are uh, begging to get an update, but they, they haven't finalized it yet. Thank you. What is the lifespan of, of an average heat pump system? Yeah, it's the same as like any other highly efficient heating system, so 15, 20 years. Uh, and it's the same thing, like say if you're like thinking about putting on a new roof, uh, people tell you you should put it on every 20 years, but there's plenty of roofs that are doing perfectly fine at 30 years old. Um, so it really is, you know, keeping up with maintenance. It, it is, uh, the systems are relatively bulletproof if they are properly installed and commissioned but 
you do need to realize that half of the system is outside in all four seasons of New England. Um, so there could be, you know, leaves, dust, dirt, debris, pests, uh, snakes, uh, like all of those things um, may end up trying to, you know, like get a home in the outdoor system. So it is important to kind of keep an eye on that, make sure vegetation isn't trying to grow up in it. A lot of times you'll put the outdoor equipment on the side of the home that they never go in and never look at and never see. Um, but yeah, just keep an eye on it. But yeah, all just as a heads up for everyone on here, say with your steam heating system, you may have a 60 or 70 year old boiler down in your basement, could even be older than that. It's just made out of steel and iron uh, and, you know, like that there's no components to it. It's just a box to set fire inside and boil water. Um, but all new high efficiency equipment, whether it's a furnace or a boiler, it's all like very engineered and machined and very thin fins of aluminum. So yeah, with an air source heat pump compared to like a 97% efficient gas furnace or 96% efficient gas boiler and 87% efficient oil system, um, they're all 15, 20 years at this point. Great, let's see what else we have here. Do you need a building permit to install heat pumps? And I think there might be a couple of different answers to that. Uh, well, Nikhil, do you wanna just touch on permits and sound ordinances and some of the other funds of doing home improvement projects in Cambridge? Um, yeah, I can take a stab at that. Uh, so the short answer is yes, there's a building permit just like you would need to install a air conditioning system or any other um, HVAC e equipment. Um, it's a pretty standard uh, building permit in the system. You know, it's a, it's a heat pump permit. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as Mike mentioned, there's the Cambridge Noise Ordinance, which is designed to uh, you know, sort of prevent uh, excess HVAC noise from affecting neighbors in, in our dense urban environment. Um, and so that's usually measured sort of at, at the fence line if, if someone were to complain. Um, like Mike said, a lot of uh, HVAC, uh, a lot of heat pump equipment is uh, a lot quieter than uh, sort of your, your traditional old AC that's running, um, but there are also measures like noise baffles and stuff that, that could be considered if it's an issue. Yeah, and one thing that I, it is just interesting to think about with the noise sound ordinances of the heat pump with traditional heat pumps first, I'd say like the cold climate ones from a lot of the Asian manufacturers is so with heat pumps, they're inverter driven. So that means the outdoor unit can ramp down and ramp up to keep up with the load. So uh, with, let's say, let's say this Bosch heat pump that a lot of people really like installing on the, it, it's also inverter driven, but on the high side, it's like 75 decibels. And on the low side, it's like 55 decibels. Now, the sound ordinance, and I don't know if it's seven, I, it may be after 7 p.m., but after 7 p.m., it needs to be under 60 decibels. So in the summertime, let's just think with this heat pump, that's not going to be problematic because 7 o'clock, sun's gone down, things have started to cool down. That heat pump's going to always be in like the lower like RPM mode, just kind of quietly humming along. No one's having any problem with it. But in the wintertime, after the sun's gone down, the heat load is the highest. So that's when that particular type of a heat pump could be running at those 75 decibels. Um, you know, wintertime overnight, that heat pump is really working hard to be able to, you know, keep the home up to 70 degrees or 68 degrees. So do you need to be a little bit careful about that with thinking about, um, with just thinking about the technology, the designs, the quotes that you're getting? It's totally 100% able to work around it. There are some particular brands that do a better job at this than others. Um, but yeah, I've worked through this nuance now with like three different um, residents before, so I'm feeling very well versed in it. Great. Looking through, I think that's 
most of the questions that we've received here. I do see a, a specific question about scheduling a consultation with Mike directly. If you shoot us email, an email, we'd be happy to look at um, reassigning that over. You can contact us. Mike, if you want to maybe go back a slide to our contact information, yep. um, we'd be happy to, to get you arranged with Mike. It's hard not, not to want to speak with him after, after tonight. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to do a, a quick once over here on the chat, but I do think that we've touched on most things. And Ryan, you checked the Q and A list as well. Yeah, I've been, I've been toggling. Okay, great. Oh, Daniel had mentioned a, a follow-up discussion about cooking equipment and clothes dryers. Uh, that that's something that we've been thinking about expanding the program to incorporate more, you know, electrification technologies. We do actually have a, a series going out on social media currently. That's a weekly series touching on sort of different uh, electrification technologies with the focus of you know a piece by piece electrifying your whole home. Um, so induction stoves are a piece of that, clothes dryers as, as well. That, that's not a, a topic of the series, but that is something else to keep in mind. Um, I don't know that it's, you know, it's something that Mike would certainly be happy to talk about, um, at least in brief during a consultation. It's not necessarily the focus of this program specifically, but I will just mention that there are rebates through MassSave for those um, types of appliances a, as well. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, Nikhil, I don't know if you were answering that question in uh, the, the QA regarding um, funding for the consultation services. Yeah, sure, I can take that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think um, I think I answered that question in the QA, but yeah, Boat is under contract with the City of Cambridge um, as a technical advisor uh, for, for this program. Um, I see some other kind of maybe more individual home specific questions in the Q&A and I would suggest if, the, if this makes sense to, to you guys that probably the best way of answering those is to set up a consultation. I agree. Don't wanna muddy the waters for, for other homeowners who may have different situations. All right, well, uh, again, please feel free to reach out by email. Uh, we would love to speak to you, especially if you're exploring a, a project of your own, um, a consultation would be highly encouraged. I think that's a great place to start. And we really appreciate everyone being here tonight. We had a great turnout. It's, it would be nice to see people's faces, but unfortunately it's just the times that we're in here. So appreciate your attendance and, and your uh, really thoughtful, engaged questions. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. I uh, hope to meet you all in person uh, very soon. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Mike, for the presentation. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Have a great night, everyone. Oh, and we will be sending out the uh, webinar recording. Bye-bye.